We're going to do now substitution, the substitution rule, so to speak, um, using double integrals in, in, in two, in two, um, in double integrals or triple integrals, we can do that too. Um, so, so that's what we're doing, substitution rule. A, in two dimensions, by that what I mean is that the input is in two dimensions and uh, on the floor. Uh, so when we integrate a function, the function is, uh, corresponds to the z value. So there is the z going on and here's the, the x and the y. And if the shape of this is particularly difficult to integrate over, what we could do is make up um, a function coming from a different plane. So this other function uh, takes a rectangle, especially a rectangle, something nice, much nicer than this. It doesn't have to be a rectangle, but rectangles are particularly nicer. Now the reason why this doesn't look like a rectangle is because it's supposed to be a three-dimensional, uh, so supposed to be more on the floor anyway. So if we take a rectangle and con be able to successfully convert it, especially into with a one-to-one -one function, um, let's call it T for now, uh, into this, then we can integrate over this rectangle instead of over this. There's a, usually a price to pay, but it's not more expensive in, in work. There's it is not much more work than if we left it this way. So that is the, the idea. We, we try to come up with a function t that takes um, a rectangle or something nice into the shape we're going to integrate into. Um, and then we can perform a double integral of this, over this, of this function over this um, region, using this region, bypassing this region altogether. That's, that's the, the idea um, behind a, the double integral. Um, there's, there's many ways to, to do things uh, from here to here, but the one I want to focus on is the rotation. So for instance, let's say we want to integrate, so, so let's talk a little bit about, about rotation. Uh, actually, let me talk about rotation first on its own, and then we're going to come back to the integration because rotation is one of the kind of um, functions we can take, we could, in which we could change something that is difficult to integrate into something that is easy to, to integrate. So let's talk about rotation in general. Uh, and, and here's where we're going to use matrices a little bit of matrices. It turns out that if you wanna rotate any shape, let's say, let's say you wanna rotate this square, you know, uh, one, zero, zero, one, and of course, one, one, and of course, zero, zero. Let's say you wanna rotate this um, 45 degrees, actually any angle, Clock, counterclockwise. Um, what we have to do is multiply each one of those as a column vector with a matrix. So the matrix, let's call it T sub theta, is going to be a matrix. Uh, and the matrix will be um, cosine of theta, sine theta, negative sine theta and cosine theta. There we go. If we want to rotate any point here, 45 degrees, then you change theta with 45 degrees, which is pi over four. So T of pi over four, a rotation of 45 degrees will be uh, cosine of 45 degrees, which is one over the square root of two. Uh, so all of them are going to be one over the square root of two. 
even this one, well, that one will be negative one over the square root of two and positive one over the square root of two. There we go. So that is the rotation, uh, 45 degrees. So let's, let's see if that is true. If we multiply this matrix with the zero, zero, and by the way, we mean the column vector zero, zero. The, in this case, we would have the column vector zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So if we multiply with zero, zero, you are gonna end up with zero, zero. So this, this matrix does not affect zero, zero. Zero, zero is invariant under multiplication with this matrix. How about zero, one? All right, so let's write down the matrix. I'm gonna factor out one over the square root of two, by the way, one over the square root of two, um, because then we end up with a super easy matrix to, to work with. So we, in matrices, we can factor, as, as long as we factor from each one of the elements in the matrix the same amount, we, we're okay. So I'm gonna multiply one over the square root of two, um, one, one, negative one, one, with, let's see where this, this point moves to, zero, one, zero, one, and um, one over the square root of two, and then we have, remember how to do the multiplication, zero plus one is one, and then zero plus one is one. So we, we end up with one over the square root of two, that's the, the when, when we multiply this back with that and one over the square root of two. Yeah, so zero, one, and then we, we think of this again as an x, y coordinate. So this, this map, t of uh, pi over four, so pi over four takes the, the point zero, one, zero, one, into uh, one over the square root of two comma one over the square root of two. Let's do that with a few. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some side work here to continue doing more multiplications. So again, we're gonna take this matrix, uh, one over the square root of two, one, one, negative one, one, and we're gonna multiply with another corner of, the, of this square. So let's multiply, for instance, with one, zero. One, zero. So we end up with, um, well, one plus zero is one, but then multiply with, with one over the square root of two. And then um, the bottom is negative one plus zero, which is negative one times one over the square root of two. So negative one over the square root of two. So here in this sheet, I'm gonna, uh, keep track of what is happening. So one zero multiplying with this gives us one over the square root of two comma negative one over the square root of two. Okay, how about one one? One over the square root of two, one negative one one one, one one. So let's see, that's one plus one is two over the square root of two. So two over the square root of two, hmm, which is by the way, the square root of two. Uh, we should simplify that, the square root of two. Uh, so again, one plus one is two over the square root of two. Yep, and then when we multiply this second row with this column, we end up with negative one plus one, zero times that still zero. So we end up with square root of two, zero, um, one, one, plus two square root of two comma zero. And we know that zero, zero goes to um, zero, zero. So this is what's going on. We are taking the square with coordinates um, one, with vertices which have coordinates one, zero, one, one, zero, one, and zero, zero. And then each one of those points gets mapped into, um, okay, let me start with this one, square root of two, zero. 
So square root of two, by the way, is gonna be the distance, the diagonal distance, uh, because if you do Pythagoras on this, is we have one by one, so the diagonal is gonna be square root of two. So this distance, you place it here, and we are about there. Okay, that's this point. So one, one, this point, let's label them. So O for origin, and I just, I'm just arbitrarily gonna say A, uh, B, C. So B mapped is, let's call this B prime, because that's, that's what this point became after the transformation. Um, and then zero one goes to one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two. Um, so that's gonna be somewhere in this 45 degree diagonal, uh, I would say about there, one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two, and that is A prime, because that came from zero, oh no, that's C prime, that came from this guy. Okay. And then one O, is to the right and down, same distance to the right and down, so about, mm, let's say there. And that is A prime. Okay, and then the origin is this uh, invariant. So here we have this region. Yep. And we can see that this square got rotated 45 degrees clockwise direction. So this is t pi over four, and that is a rotation. Um, you may be, you gotta be careful with, with transformations like this because it is not necessarily true that every time you multiply, you transform something, you end up with uh, you know, straight lines turn into straight lines. Sometimes they don't, they curve depending on the transformation. This transformation is pretty rigid, but but let's make sure that we actually end up with something that does not curve. Where is my... Oh, there it is, I was underneath. I'm, I was looking for these computations, my side work. So let's take just a generic point here. Um, it is convenient to use different letters for this plane versus this plane. This plane can be labeled as the X, Y plane. And while this plane can be labeled as the U, V plane, U, V, X, Y. So let's see what happens with this line. The line is uh, V equal to zero. So that means that U may be anything. Those points on the bottom of the square can the u can be between zero and one inclusive, and the v has to be zero. So let's see what happens when you have u zero ma multiplied with this matrix. Yeah, of course we have, let's see, u zero, so just u over the square root of two, and then negative u zero, negative u over the square root of two. Now this, this is why it is convenient to have an x and y. So this corresponds to x and this corresponds to y. So, so in this case, x is equal to u over the square root of two, while y, semicolon, y equals the opposite of that. So, so if y is the opposite of what x is, that means that we can just write down as an, as an equation. So consolidating those two, we have that y equals the opposite of x. So the line u, rather v equal to zero, which is this line down here, becomes on this plane, the line y equals negative x, which is this line. So sure enough, if, 
And that will happen to any line. If you have a line in any direction and you apply this matrix, we will obtain a rotation of the line by 45 degrees in the clockwise direction. Now, the same thing will happen if you have um, a rotation by, 40, by 60 degrees, for instance, or by 120 degrees. You, you pick your angle. You can always rotate any shape, any graph you ever wanted this way. And that is part of analytic geometry. Uh, and I think it's very, very neat um, to see how things rotate. You can take a parabola and actually rotate it sideways. Uh, I, I think that is very, very neat to see how, how that works. Okay, so well, let's, let's stay with, with this theme. So what happens to, to UV? Um, yeah, let's continue here. What happens to, so let me, because uh, I started writing here off the, the line and I don't want to confuse with the next computation. One over the square root of two, one, one, negative one, one. And what if we do a general U and V, we're going to obtain a new coordinates which are going to correspond to X and Y, but what are they? Um, so here, when we multiply, we get, um, so I'm going to continue down here, U, plus V as, as we go across this way. Um, and we can keep this outside to, to keep things simple. One over the square root of two. And then we have a U plus V, negative U plus V. And remember that corresponds to X and Y. So what we are saying is that X is equal to one over the square root of two quantity u plus v, while y equals one over the square root of two negative u plus v. So that is the, the way to obtain excess from those, from those u's. Yep. Yep. So, so the, the, if you want to rotate, so that so that we end up with with this box, uh, this box. Yeah. Um, it's a square. It's a unit square, one by one. But we rotate it forty five degrees. Uh, the way to obtain this is to go. Let's see, and come back, and and start with a really nice square here, and map it through these transformations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everywhere where you have an X and a Y, so if you're integrating, if you're having a double integral with a function X, Y, and this is your, um, with respect to the area, this is the region you're integrating over, uh, let me write, this is, this is getting a little messy here. So let me rewrite this. So again, so we have X equals one over the square root of two U plus V. Y equals one over the square root of two um, negative U plus V. What this does again is that it takes uh, anything, but in particular, a one by one square into a rhombus exactly of the same size. It doesn't change the size. It only rotates clockwise uh, by 45 degrees. If you want to integrate here, so let's say this is E, uh, some function with respect to the area. There we go. This is particularly not too easy to integrate because it is not of type one or type two. Um, it, you have to split it up and maybe integrate from, from the left corner to the middle because we have different boundaries here as we have on the right side. 
So then you have to invariably, you have to split this into two integrals and it could get even worse. So it could, it would be way more convenient to integrate with that. And the, and, and can we do that? Yes. Um, this would be a double integral of uh, C A hmm. It is going to be F of U and V. So what we have to do is everywhere there is an X, you have to exchange the X with this quantity. And everywhere where there is a Y, you have to exchange it with this. So it's going to get a little hectic for a moment. So this is going to be um, X seen as a function of U and V. Uh, it's not going to fit here. So, so. So this is, it's gonna get longer. So it's a double integral f of x, which in itself is a function of u, v, comma, y, which is a function of u, v, close parenthesis of the f, with respect to the area. And now we're gonna have this other region, which is not the same as this region. Uh, let's call it, uh, a, B, C, D, E. So D, because that's before E over D. But there is, we have to pay a price. We have to, to multiply by something here. Every time we do that, we, can we do that? The answer is yes, but we have to pay a price. We have to compensate for the change. And this is called the Jacobian. Jacobian. Um, we did this in one in Calc one. Um, so in Calc one, you know, when, when we were integrating things like, you know, the integral um, of the square root of one minus x squared, let's say from zero to one, I'm not going to do this completely. I just want to show you. Remember what we did this in Calc one. Um, we said, okay, X has to be a, in, in order for this to work, the sine of theta. And uh, DX consequently will be the cosine of theta D theta. So we end up with um, changing this around. This is equal to the integral from zero to pi over two because that's what gets a one up here. So we did change that. That's equivalent to changing this into that. We have to make an adjustment. And then, uh, of course, the whole point of this is to simplify, but let me write it down without simplifying. Okay, so we have one minus x squared, one minus sine squared, that makes sense. But we did not put d theta. We put, yes, we put d theta but we have to put something else, which is the cosine of theta. Well, that turns out to be the Jacobian as well. We just never called it the Jacobian before, but it is the same, the same thing. We can change the variable. There's a price to pay, which is the cosine. So this simplifies nicely into just cosine. You know, one minus sine squared is cosine squared, take the square root, all the numbers are positive, so we're good. We get, end up with cosine of theta. But with, there's a price to pay, we gotta integrate cosine squared, which is not as nice as cosine, but this was gonna be more difficult to start with anyway. So by doing this, we are saving ourselves um, a lot of time and effort and work and possibly tears, but, but, so because this is more difficult than this, this is, uh, this is a little bit of routine work, cosine squared. And um, the same kind of thing is gonna happen here. If we integrate over this region, are we gonna be able to do it? Probably yes, but it's gonna be more work. Right off the bat, we have to split this into two integrals. Um, and then on top of that, we, we have to do a, the two integrals and then we have to do each one individually. If we do this, we have a nice one integral. There's going to be a price to pay, yes, but that's going to be way nicer than typically than if we were working straight out with this region. 
So how do we compute the Jacobian? Yep. Um, so the Jacobian um, of x equals some function, I'm, I'm just gonna call it x, of u and v and y equals a function of u and v is, so we have a new notation, uh, partial x, y with respect to u, v. And it turns out that this is equal to the determinant of the partial x uh, with respect to u, partial, whoops, x with respect to a u, rather v. Uh, let me, this is getting messy and I, I don't really wanna be messy. So sorry to do this. Let's just write this again. The Jacobian of x equals x of u v and uh, y equals y of u v is partial x y with respect to u v, which is the determinant partial x with respect to u, partial x with respect to v, partial y with respect to u, partial a y again with respect to v. So this determinant, which means find all of those four partials and then multiply those two minus the product of those two. And, then, and that's, that's how we go about finding the Jacobian. Four are uh, going from two into two. You can find the Jacobian from, for, for going from three into three. So the Jacobian of, okay, so now we got three X, which would be a function, an X, here I'm making mistakes, um, X of U, V, W, Y as a function of U, V, W, and Z as a function of u v w <coughs> the jacobian for this transformation would be the partial so this notation before i forget is a new notation we haven't seen it before notation and it's a made up notation to to uh, denote this determinant which is called the jacobian of the transformation so the Jacobian is the partial x, y, z with respect to u, v, w. So we have a big determinant, three by three. Each one of them is gonna be a partial. So partial x with respect to u, partial x with respect to v, partial x with respect to w. And then we go the same thing across with the y partial y with respect to u, partial y with respect to v, partial y with respect to w. And then with z, partial z with respect to u, partial z with respect to v, partial z with respect to w. That's why we had to go in the previous video, um, into how we find a three by three determinant. Finding the two by two determinant is not a big deal. Well, as long as it's not too dramatic, finding a three by three determinant is more dramatic. So again, this is new notation that we are learning. Yep. yep. Um, we could go on why this is the case. Um, an explanation of why I don't want to deviate too much from um, from this talk, um, but 
let's let's do an example first and then let's explain why. All right. Oh, before we do the example, let's do an example of, of finding a Jacobian first and and then we we do an, an example we will do an example a with an integration. So remember our so let's call this example I don't think we've done an actual example yet of, of anything in this video. So let's label this example one. So x one over the square root of two u plus v y equals one over the square root of two negative u plus v. And what is the Jacobian of this transformation? All right. So that is the question. Find the Jacobian find the x, y with respect to u, v. So, so partial, partial x, y with respect to um, u, v. Okay, so what is the partial of this with respect to u? Well, the v is a constant, so we just end up with one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two. Partial of the same thing with respect to V, well, U is a constant, so we end up with one times that. Partial of that with respect to U, uh -huh, we're gonna end up with negative one times one over the square root of two. And then partial of that with respect to V. Okay, so multiply those two across, we get one half multiply those and subtract the product of those two across. So that is negative half. So the Jacobian is one. So if you apply this transformation, you're gonna end up, we, remember um, back here in the integral, boy, I'm losing my pages today. Oh, there it is. Yep. So here, the Jacobian would be one. By the way, polar coordinates has a Jacobian and we should find the Jacobian corresponding to polar coordinates. Remember, um, so example two, um, polar or cylindrical, polar, Let's stay with polar coordinates. Uh, the transformation into polar coordinates has a Jacobian. And you guys remember what it is, but let's, let's double check that this general theory is consistent with what we have learned before. So we got uh, R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta. So the Jacobian um, of x, y with respect to r theta, let's see. Uh, so the derivative of this with respect to r is just the cosine theta. The derivative of this with respect to theta is negative r sine theta. The derivative of that with respect to r is sine of theta. The derivative of that with respect to theta is cosine theta. Oh, I'm missing the r. r, because the r is a constant with respect to theta. Okay, so we got r cosine squared minus r sine squared, negative rather, r sine squared theta. So there's a negative due to the discriminant, not discriminant, determinant, and there's a negative because we have a negative term, a negative element there. So that is a negative, and that negative comes from the determinant, you know, the determinant. So those two are plus, you already know where this is going. You got r cosine squared plus r sine squared, factor out the r, um, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So we end up with r 
So R is the Jacobian of the polar coordinates. And now we know where that R is coming from. So if, if we don't tell you that you have to multiply, if we didn't tell you that, and you knew this section, this, this topic of general transformations and how we deal with integration under general transformations, uh, you would know how to handle it now. You just find the Jacobian and then you're in business. Then you can, you can do it. We don't have to tell you that R is the Jacobian any longer after this section. And in fact, you can come up with any transformation of your own. All right, let's do an example. Uh, let's do a different example. I have, I have a different example I, I wanted to, to show you. So example two, okay, this is an integration example. Okay, so we want to evaluate uh, the double integral of y squared over e with respect to the area. And I'm gonna describe with a picture what e is. Um, so e is gonna be um, polynomial, not a polynomial, um, uh, just a flat figure with, with straight sides. Uh, one vertex is gonna be zero, zero. Another vertex is gonna be out here and it will be square root of three, one. And then another one down here at one comma negative square root of three. And this has to close into a uh, square. It actually turns out to be a square. So this vertex here is gonna be the sum of those two. So, so one plus the square root of three comma one minus the square root of three. Whoa. All right, so we want to integrate y squared over this um, square. This turns out to be a square. Uh, the angles are correct because uh, if you multiply those two vectors with a dot product, you're gonna end up with zero, which means that those two are perpendicular. And um, so those two are perpendicular and, and then you can figure out the other, the other angles and the side, by the way, the, the length of the side is two because you can just use Pythagoras to figure the distance between those two. Uh, square root of three squared is three plus one is four, square root of four is two. So this is a square um, of length two. Now, if we wanna do this with integration, this is not a type one, type two kind of a region. We would have to split this into three integrals, no matter what. If you go vertical, then you got to split on this corner because we we're changing from this boundary into this boundary, and then we got to split here. So so we got to split into three. If you want to do it straight out as is, can we do it? Absolutely yes. Not to mention you gotta find the equation of this, this line, uh, which is gonna be just the equation of this line. Man, y equals rise over run, so one over the square root of three x. And this one is gonna be uh, negative square root of three over one x. But then this is gonna be more difficult because who knows where it's gonna inter in intersect on the y-axis. This one is gonna be even more difficult 
again, because who knows where it's gonna intersect on the Y axis. So just finding those lines, those two are gonna, is gonna be a task. Then splitting this up into three parts, you know, we're gonna integrate with respect to, eventually with respect to X from zero to one, from one to the square root of three, from the square root of three to uh, this number, one plus square root of three. Um, it can, it, it, I, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if, if we, I would want to even try it because there's a lot of things involved. Now, if we rotate this the other way, we end up with a very, very nice square uh, from zero to two. And integrating over this region, let's label this as region D, would be way nicer, way, way nicer. Okay, so the question is, what transformation, transformation allows us to go from here to here? Hmm. And of course, you, you, I think you're familiar with, with this, uh, with this, if, if you divide this by two, you end up with square root of three over two and one over two. And that, those numbers should be familiar. They come from the unit circle. How much are we rotating this, this square to get to this square clockwise? And of course that is gonna be not 45 degrees, not 30 degrees, but 60 degrees. So if we rotate 60 degrees this way, which is pi over three, then we will obtain that. And remember, before I, I had mentioned that the matrix that corresponding to our rotation of theta degrees, we label it as T theta, in this case, pi over three, will be um, the matrix with a cosine of pi over three. Let's see, let's think, cosine of pi over three is one half. And then the sine of pi over three um, the sine of pi over three is the square root of three over two. And then the negative of that goes here, negative square root of three over two. And then this number goes there, one half. Okay, so, so I, I said as a fact that if you wanna rotate clockwise by an angle theta, you do cosine theta, sine theta, once you have those two numbers, then the rest is easy. Take this guy, do the opposite, put it there. Take this guy as is and put it there. And then you're all set. That creates a rotation. How? Um, if we multiply that matrix, one half, a negative square root of three over two, square root of three over two and, and one half again, by a generic UV, Okay, let's see what we get. We're gonna get half u plus square root of three over two v, and then negative square root of three over two u plus half v. And remember, this is x and y. So the transformation that that makes this square go into that square that is, has been rotated would be um, oh, x is equal to half u plus square root of three over two v, y equals negative square root of three over two u plus half v. We want to know also the corresponding a Jacobian. So derivative of this, partial derivative of this with respect to u, a half. Partial derivative of the same thing with respect to v, square root of three over two, Partial derivative of this with respect to u, negative square root of three over two. Partial derivative of this with respect to v is a half. Boy, that's the same matrix we started with. 
that is not necessarily coincidence in this case. Um, and that is equal to a quarter plus, when we multiply those two, I'm already taking into account this negative with the fact that we're gonna subtract the product of the elements in this diagonal. So there is a double negative, three, fours. So the Jacobian is one. That is sweet because then we don't have to worry about a, about a Jacobian. Multiplying by one does not affect whatever we have. So, okay. What are we after? We want the double integral of y squared over e um, with respect to the area. And as I had mentioned before, it's a mess because if I want to figure this out with vertical, you know, strips, then X has to go from here to here, from there to there, from there to there, no, from, from here to the end. And we would have to split this into, consequently into three integrals because either the, this boundary is different as we transition from this into that region, from this region into this region, or this boundary is different as we transition from this region to this region. So invariably we have to have three integrals. On top of that, we have to find the equations of the boundaries themselves. And I don't even know, uh, well, the, the slope here would have to be y equals the same slope as this because those two are parallel. So rise over run negative square root of three x. But then we would have to find where that intersects. Again, that is, it's a good problem to do by, by yourself, by hand, but boy, um, yeah, it, it, it will take a, a few pages, a couple pages at least to do that. Instead, we're gonna go from zero to two, zero to two on, on here. Um, yeah, we're just gonna go, we're gonna integrate not on E, we're gonna integrate on D instead. So that corresponds to D, which is this square. And we gotta be careful, we're integrating Y squared. Y is negative square root of three over two U plus half V negative square root of three over two u plus half, whoops, v, close parenthesis, squared. So that is y squared with respect to u and v. So because we are integrating not here, but here, the variables are different. Now we have u and v as opposed to x and y, which were the original variables. The original problem was in terms of X and Y. We're changing it into a problem in U and V. Now, you're gonna say, wait a minute, this is more complicated because this is just Y squared, that wasn't too bad. Yes, but remember, just finding the equation of this line is, is a task in itself. It's gonna take me a couple minutes to do that. And that's just that and then the other line, I mean, and then splitting it up into three integrals. There's many, many more parts to do, more little tasks to do here. Here we're done. We just go through the integration already. The integration is already set, set up so that it works and we get nice boundaries. Yep. So uh, let's just go through the motions. Zero, two, we gotta foil this out. Um, yeah, I'm gonna foil. There's probably a way to use U substitution, some kind of U substitution, but let's just fold this out. So we got three over four, three over four U squared minus the product of those two twice. So that cancels with this half because the twice portion uh, square root of three over two uh, UV plus V squared. There we go, VU. V. So we're integrating with respect to U. The V is uh, waiting to be happening. 
So we're going to have 3 over 4. That's u. So we're going to end up with u cubed over 3. I'm going to pull a fast one on u because we got a 0 and we got polynomial. We can do, we can plug in the 2 at once. So 2 cubed over 3, okay, minus square root of 3 over 2. And then that is going to be u um, squared over 2. But since the bottom is, is a 0, we just plug in the, the top. So 2 squared over 2v plus uh, v squared. But then we get to multiply by u because this is a constant and antiderivative is the constant times the variable. So again, just 2, 2 over 1 or 2. And then we're going to integrate that with respect to v. So the 3s will simplify. There's only a 2 surviving on this term. This is a constant. It's just 2. We're integrating 2. So when we do the antiderivative, we're going to have 2v. That's it. I plug in the 2 and the 0. So 2 times 2. And again, the reason for that is the 3s simplify. Uh, 8 divided by 4 is the 2. And then the other 2 comes from the plugging the v into v. That is going to be v squared over 2. Um, OK, so that's 2 squared. And we got 2, 2. So those that 4 cancels with the denominator. So we still have the negative square root of 3. OK, and then that's going to turn into v squared over 2. Plug in the 2. We also have 2. Plus, that's going to be um, 2 cubed over 3. 2 times 2 cubed over 3. 16 over 3. All right, let's 4 minus 2 root 3 plus 16 over 3. Um, well, that's 12 over 3. And 16 over 3, that's 28 over 3 minus 2 root 3. And that's it. Mm, there's not a lot of drama on this problem. Why? Why? Because we, we changed it. Instead of this uh, ugly, even though it's a nice square, this ugly transformation or this uh, region, we changed it into that. Oh, don't forget. At this point, I, I forgot to emphasize, we were supposed to multiply by the Jacobian. Very, very, don't forget the Jacobian. The reason why um, it did not matter in this particular case is because our Jacobian is one. But the Jacobian of polar coordinates is R. The Jacobian of uh, spherical coordinates is rho squared times sine of P. So uh, the, 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 now the Jacobian of uh, of a rotation is always going to be one because you got cosine, sine, negative sine, and, and cosine. So you always end up with cosine squared plus sine squared. So that's always going to be one. Uh, you could have proven that before, even you know, doing these numbers. So rotations are going to be okay. You don't you don't have to worry about the Jacobian. Because well, you do have to worry about the Jacobian every time, but the Jacobian of rotations happens to be the number one. And multiplying by one does not does not change much in this case. Um, but now we are free. This gives us freedom to transform anything into anything we ever wanted, and uh, things will will work reasonably well. Um, and now we have more, more more freedom. In fact, let me let me just do one more show you one more thing. So what, what happened back in polar coordinates? Polar um, coordinates. What happened is that oftentimes we want to integrate over a circle of radius r, okay? 
Um, so what we have done is take a rectangle, um, R theta, let's say the radius is five, just to give an example. So you go up to five, and then theta goes to two pi from zero to two pi, two pi, which is actually more than five. So this picture should be taller than, than wider, but bear with my wrong scale. What we have done, when we, when we say that x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta, for purposes of integration and integrating over, over a circle, what we have done is transform a, rect a circle into a rectangle. Actually, a rectangle into a circle, and then we are using this rectangle to integrate. So we are really integrating from zero to five on the r's, from zero to two pi on the thetas, and, and it works beautifully. Um, there is, we did mention that the, the in, at some point earlier that the transformation has to be one to one. And I'm just realizing that in this case, the transformation is not one to one because when R is zero, all of these points, see, you cannot really change a rectangle into a circle without pinching uh, things together, putting things together, crumbling things together. So what we are doing is, okay, so the radius. Yeah, this becomes the edge of the circle all the way around. Uh, this side and that side. Uh, so pretend you got the circle and it has a little opening, which doesn't, but pretend it has an opening. So we go from zero to two pi. I'm, there's no gap in between, actually the circle closes, but I'm putting a gap just to make a point. Because where do the sides go? When, well, that's one question somebody can ask. Well, you have a radius of five. So this side, let's call it A, is all the way around A. Um, B, that happens when, when the angle is zero, would be this guy. C would be this side. See, because this shape has three sides, the outside going in and going out. Okay, where's the other side? Where is, so C, where is D, the side D? D is crunched here in the point. All of D gets crunched together into one point. That's the only one, that is the, the only point the, the on, the, the, or the only points that get crunched into one point. All the other ones are one-to-one. -one. So when we say that we have a one-to-one -one transformation, uh, that is not 100% correct because polar coordinates don't obey that rule. However, um, if the boundaries get crunched, if the boundaries are the only ones that, that don't obey that rule, we, we, are, we are good, we're okay. Um, the other question is, okay, so, so we're taking a nice, usually we want to, to take a nice rectangle and we're changing it uh, in UV into some kind of weird uh, shape. So there's supposed to be a corner. Yeah, so the question, so this is two dimensional. Um, what accounts for the for the uh, Jacobian? How does the Jacobian come about? That's the question. Um, the thing is, if you take this tangent, uh, now you gotta be careful. One of them corresponds to U and one of them corresponds to V. And I don't necessarily, necessarily want to claim, so this, Okay, so this could be the derivative of x with respect to, well, it's a, this is a vector, so dx 
the u comma d x um, I had to actually pause the moment to, to double check something. Okay, I'm back. I, I just wanna make, make sure that my computations were gonna work okay. So I just gotta raise this. I, there we go. So we have a vector dx dy, well dx du, dy, partial with respect to u, okay? So that's gonna be this vector. This vector over here would, be, would have coordinates the x, the v comma the y dv. So it tells us how this is changing, this curve is changing with respect to increasing u or increasing v. And edges, unless we have some kind of reduction into, into one point, but typically edges are gonna, are, edges are gonna be mapped into edges. Now the, the edges here may be curved as with polar coordinates. So we can approximate this area by using those two vectors uh, and multiplying, finding the cross product of two vectors and finding the magnitude of the corresponding um, cross product. Now these two vectors are in two dimensions. So we have to embed those vectors into three dimensional vectors so we can perform the cross product. I'm gonna uh, simplify the notation. So this is X sub U comma Y sub U comma zero. So I'm not claiming this vector is the same as that vector. We are embedding this vector into a three-dimensional space in such a way that those two vectors are gonna be on the same plane. So the two vectors are gonna have um, y, v, zero on the third component. Again, very important, those are not the same vectors. We're embedding into three-dimensional space so we can perform the cross product. So we're gonna end up with um, zero, zero, x u y v minus x v y u. Yep, and then the, the magnitude um, will be that precisely, just just that because the other two are zero. So um, that is how much area we will we will have. It, yes. One thing I want to clarify though is that I don't know in advance without knowing the specific transformation whether this will refer to to one direction to to this side or or the other one, because things could flip on the transformation. So we don't know, this is just a generic, a generic graph. We, we don't know that this guy on the left, you know, if you look at it this way, correspond to this, we, we just don't know. There, things could flip and then they could flip again. And that's why we cannot take just the absolute value. We have to take this with its sign because things could flip. Um, and then the, the, the cross product could go the other way. So assuming this goes one direction, it could go the other direction and we got, we got to take that into account. So we got to be careful with, with the signs. But anyhow, um, so, so the magnitude, so with mag, I'm going to put magnitude, magnitude, because magnitude should have an absolute value and we're not going to impose absolute value on this. Uh, is gonna be the same or equivalent to just this component. And we have x u times y v minus x v times a y u, yes. 
And that is exactly partial x, partial u, partial x, partial v, partial y, partial u, partial y, partial v, the determinant of that, which is exactly the same thing as partial with our new notation, x, y, partial u, v. And voila, that's where, so by approximating, see, when we do the transformation, the areas are not gonna match. An, an area of a square is not gonna be the area of a square of the same dimension, not at all whatsoever. Occasionally will, like well, as with rotations, with rotations, things will work fine because the, the vectors are just gonna rotate and that's it. So a 90 degree angle is gonna be preserved after the rotation. But in general, we may not expect that at all whatsoever. Um, back in the, when I was showing you the polar coordinate stuff, so a line, okay, with the same, this line is gonna be transformed into some kind of ray, radius, and this line is gonna be curve. So things are not gonna, are gonna be, so the angle is, are not gonna be quite as nice. And the same thing happens in general, we don't know what the angle is gonna be. So we have to take into account the cross product because that will tell us how much things are changing by. And that is the, the, a basic explanation and informal explanation of why we need to multiply by the Jacobian to compensate for the lo loss or gain in area as we go from one region to a different region. And now we're gonna close this video.